talk. It doesn't seem like that long ago that we, uh, we started. Um, with um, the two Richards, Richard Bourne and Richard Hedditch from uh, Campaign for Better Transport, uh, talking about how to London. Um, one of the more uh, difficult, although some might say easier, places to achieve uh, uh, change in travel habits, but also a key uh, election battleground uh, over the next uh, few months. Mm -hmm. So um, just before I hand you over to, to um, Richard Hedditch to start, that's right, yeah. Um, just a quick reminder of, of the, the format, so um, the two Richards will talk for about 45 minutes, uh, then we'll take a 15 minute break, give everyone a chance to recharge their glasses, uh, and then come back for questions and discussion uh, afterwards. Oh sorry, I should just say, uh, I'm Bruce uh, from Movement for Liverpool London, uh, there's a few others here, Joe has ever staring at a computer screen, uh, Mark somewhere at the back, and uh, Lucy who, uh, if you're not already on our mailing list, um, come and find Lucy at some point uh, before she finds you and, uh, and sign up. Uh, so I'll just hand over to Richard. Thank you very much. Um, this is built as a double act, um, but actually um, Richard Moore is going to do most of the talking. Um, uh, he's going to claim credit for most of the, uh, his content. Um, I'm just going to introduce it and then finish at the end, wrap up some, some questions maybe for discussion um, afterwards. Um, before we start, um, hands up who thinks they live in inner London. And hands up who thinks that they've been out of London. So that's a, a, pretty, a pretty good mix. For those who live in out of London, um, maybe shout out what your, your main form of transport is. Okay, um, so you're not necessarily a typical out of London. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, what are we going to talk about? Uh, we're going to talk about why travelling out of London is different, um, what can be done to change travel patterns, and then a bit about how might this happen. Um, is there political leadership to make it happen? Um, as usual with things that involve the questions, like in headlines that have a question, the usual answer is no, um, but we'll, we'll see whether that is the case um, towards the end. Um, but I'll say a bit about um, campaign for better transport. Uh, we used to be called Transport 2000, and uh, we changed our name in 2007. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure quite why it took us seven years to realise that the, there's a new century. But um, well, we're now called Campaign for the Transport. Um, our vision is a country where communities have affordable transport that improves quality of life and protects the environment. And most of our focus is really on, on national campaigning. Uh, I'll talk a bit about those, those three campaigns, but we also support uh, local campaigning as well. And Richard's been working uh, focused on London for the last sort of five, six years, I think it is. Um, and uh, during that time, obviously, we've seen the congestion charge, uh, we've seen uh, Boris coming in as mayor, focus on uh, elements of, of cycling, I'm sure you have opinions on those. Um, and obviously, we're looking about what we do towards the next mayoral elections. Um, but a lot of our focus in London is quite difficult because it's very crowded in terms of campaigning, it's very political transport in London, unlike uh, sort of national issues, um, transport matters in London. Nationally, transport is an important issue for, for most MPs. Okay, so um, quickly about our campaigns. We have three campaigns. The first of those is called Fair Fares Now, which is about campaigning for cheaper, simpler, and fairer rail fares. Uh, that's Michael Taylor, who is our patron, signing up to the campaign that we launched at the beginning of this year. Um, we're carrying on campaigning um, Flares are due to go up by around a third over the next sort of four to five years because of the change to a uh, new formula where fares rise by 50% above inflation each year for the national rail. Um, on TFL, it's 2% above inflation. We've also been campaigning to save um, buses. So I'll say your buses campaign, we took like, a bus to each of the party conferences. Uh, that's very evil at Labour Party conference. Uh, it looks like Brad Pitt. Um, on the left of that picture, uh, but it's actually good for students, um, and students are particularly hit by uh, changes in the loss of the educational maintenance allowance and, and loss of bus services as well, and rising prices. So we are quite focused on that. And the third area for our public campaigning is around road building. So this is on the site of the proposed Bexel Hastings Link Road. Uh, so it's the, the local group protesting against the plans for that road. Um, Half the transport currently have proposals to them for local transport schemes, much of which are big road schemes. So this is one of the big road schemes that we're opposing and trying to propose uh, or send alternatives. Um, and we also work on traffic reduction and 
the planning system as well. So the government's been proposing um, the new national planning policy framework. We've done lots of work around that, trying to oppose the way it would lead to more school um, and developers' charter. Um, I'm going to hand over to Richard now, who will do most of the, the talking. Um, and he's going to look at kind of what, how London, how out of London is different to London, and what we might do to try and improve transport in out of London. Thank you. And to, it's very um, convenient actually for us to be giving this talk this evening about out of London because um, we've been working on, on out of London um, for some time with a view to developing a sort of manifesto that we could pre present to um, mayoral candidates. And so this has spurred us to get something done on time. Um, and uh, a lot of the material that you see here is actually being sort of drawn together. Um, for that, for that purpose. And, uh, and it begins really with a, with a background um, to, um, to outer London and, and some of its transport characteristics. Um, you can see here um, which are um, the outer London boroughs. The light grey is inner London and the, and, and the, sort of the mid grey is, uh, is central London. And outer London is approximately two thirds of the London land area. It also has approximately two thirds of uh, the population of, of London, um, and um, and the um, um, and just one of the facts about out of London is that um, the carbon emissions per resident are higher than they are for the residents of uh, of inner London or central London. sort of pertinent um, transport uh, uh, details about the transport habits of, uh, of people in outer London. Um, you can see <coughs> that, um, that that about 50% of, uh, of trips um, by, the, um, by, the, by, by the residents of inner London are, or, or sorry, I'll start that again, the, um, the car ownership in, in inner London and outer London is very different. And the residents of of, uh, of inner London, uh, more than 50%, nearly 60% of them don't have a car, and only 26% of journeys um, by inner London residents, you can see in the fifth uh, row along, column along, are, are, by, are made by car, um, and, uh, and about 20, just over 20% by public transport. But um, outer London residents have um, travel habits much more typical of the whole country, um, and um, and uh, uh, I think more than 50% of, of households have at least one car, and 50% of journeys are made by car. Uh, a very much smaller number by, uh, by public transport, and a negligible uh, proportion of journeys are made, are, are made by bike. Um, the, these are the figures for the, uh, for the individual in the London boroughs. Um, which uh, may be familiar to some of you, um, and, and the, the figures for um, for uh, car use range from about 13% of journeys down to 17% um, you know, is it in Islington, a, a very small number of journeys made by car by the residents. Um, I, I, sorry, I've gone too far. Um, out of London again is a different picture. Where um, you know you get a very high proportion of journeys. Uh, the highest I think I see there is uh, 60 odd percent of journeys made by car, and that is typical of sort of suburban areas across the country. Uh, and that, um, that 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 arises. Sorry, uh, I know here, here this is this this results in um, in. Uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a big difference in, um, in, in figures for um, traffic for, for a decline in, uh, in traffic because traffic actually is declining um, has been declining across the London area for um, for um, the last decade or more so that you get a, a decline a pronounced decline um, in central London particularly provoked by the introduction of congestion charge in 2003 that's the red line. Um, but amounting to an almost 20% reduction in traffic volume in, um, in, in, in central London. 
uh, the figure is, uh, is, is, uh, is still strong, but not as strong for inner London, where you get about a 10% um, decline in, um, in traffic volumes over the last 10 years. Uh, and there's been really um, only a small um, um, drop in, uh, in, the, in the amount of traffic in outer London, um, less than about, well, about, about um, four percent or something like that. These are continuing trends, and and, and, and they are um, reflected in other parts um, of the um, of, of the country. There are other cities where traffic volumes are declining, but uh, the threat remains, as we'll see um, later, of of a growth in congestion again. Um, and, um, so the that arises of traffic, um, you know, traffic is generated um, in, in outer London in greater proportions than in inner London, partly because um, the public transport network is much less dense um, and, uh, and much less accessible, so that you can see that, um, that, that, that it's very easy to get to, um, to public transport in, in central and inner London and only easy to get to public transport around the town centres of outer London, which we'll be coming back to again. The town centres are a matter that I have some things to say about. Uh, and this is a more, in a way, a more interesting figure of the same kind, which shows um, access to, um, to opportunities and services, which I think means employment, and um, to um, shops and um, social services, health, um, and so on, and, and, and that's uh, quite similar to the picture for public transport accessibility, um, but it, it does show you that really um, a, a lot of the places in outer London are, you know, have very poor access to the, um, to the services and amenities that you need every day for your daily life, and this is really the, um, what provides the motive for people to get in their cars and make, um, and make trips by, by car. Um, and uh, and, and the, that, that situation is aggravated by continuing loss of, uh, of local shops in the face of competition from, um, from, from the, uh, the supermarkets, um, by the disappearance of, of post offices and banks, um, and by the concentration of schools and hospitals into ever larger and more centralized facilities that are further away and, uh, from where people live. And also, I suspect, um, but I could be wrong about this, by uh, some continuing um, loss of employment in outer London. Uh, well, obviously there is, because there's a loss of employment um, in central and inner London also, but, but maybe it's relatively greater in outer London, and so those people who are in, in employment have to travel further for it and travel probably to, um, to central, um, perhaps in their London. Um, and, uh, and again, it's aggravated by, the, by, by a, a continuing increase in the, in, the, in the amount of development, which has large catchment areas, um, and um, out-of-town retail development is uh, is, is obviously one one type of business and the, the, the business and retail parts on the, situated on the trunk road network um, and not so much on the public transport network and again by the centralised health facilities that we discussed. The polyclinics at one time it seemed that, that they might be a threat to sort of local amenities that people could reach on foot or by bike, but actually. Um, I don't know that those fears turned out to be justified, um, or that there has been much of a rise in the, in the, in, in, uh, in, um, the development of polyclinics. Sorry, anyway. what do the figures represent? These, these, are, these are figures which I was just about to come on to, Chris. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for prompting Sorry. me to get there. Um, those are the figures for, um, for the sort of developments that do have large catchment areas. And you can see that what happens there is you, you get a, a large catchment area and a corresponding amount of parking space provided at those developments. So that at White City, um, for the West Field of White City, you have 4,500 parking spaces. At Stratford City, 10,000 parking spaces. Um, half of that in the West Field um, at Stratford. 
Um, Battersea Power Station, sorry, some of these are not um, out of London. Battersea Power Station has apparently got 3,500 parking spaces, despite um, a new um, extension of the Northern Line being part of the plans for that development. Uh, Brent Cross is the worst. It, it actually has um, it's at eight and a half thousand. I don't know why I've got seven and a half thousand there. So, so it's, it's because I can use it with Earlsport. But Brent Cross at the moment has eight and a half thousand, and plans which have been approved for the expansion of Brent Cross will bring that um, amount of parking up to twenty thousand car, car parking spaces. So this really is the origin of uh, of traffic growth, if you like, um, and of traffic. Is, uh, is the developments which provide for people to travel by car on a massive scale and, uh, and, and which therefore give rise to, uh, to traffic growth. And you can see that a lot of these developments are actually, um, are actually um, trading on their parking, uh, on their, the availability of parking. This is from the, from the, um, the website of Westfield. Stratford City and it, and it draws prominent attention to the fact that there is two hours of free parking if you go there for the 5,000 or so spaces that are attached to the, uh, to the shopping centre. And here, um, in a rather distorted, all these pictures actually are rather distorted, I mean, it was, we, we produced it on a, on a square screen and now it's rectangular. Um, but this is Brent Cross at, at the moment, and you can see that the, the bit um, surrounded by sort of, uh, you know, uh, or disguised by a, a sort of circle of trees is the, is the existing Brent Cross shopping centre. Oh, slightly south of the line of trees is, is, is extension car parks. One of them I think has never really been brought into use, but will be um, in the current plans. And then below the North Circular Road, which you couldn't see um, intersecting the picture slightly diagonally, there's, there's more um, drive-in and superstores and, and, uh, and Toys R Us and other places, uh, all also with their own uh, parking solution. And that's a sort of nightmare, that sort of ludicrous um, you know, absurd, um, view of uh, uneconomic land use. Um, and the result uh, is that um, you get um, a poor, poor public realm. People have come here and talked about this um, a lot more than I intend to do this evening. Um, and uh, you know, low street quality, domination by traffic going to these destinations. You get lower densities of development. You get um, you know more um, more crossovers across pavements um, of tra for traffic, um, where traffic has priority over pedestrians. And you get um, and you get um, fewer cycle facilities, uh, which are of a poorer standard. And, um, and you get congestion um, throughout the London area. And, and you can see that uh, despite the fact that um, car use, um, you know, that, that there is a much larger area for the car, car, for car travel to occur in, there are in fact probably as many um, congestion hotspots um, in outer London as there are in central and inner London. Um, they might be slightly more dispersed, but there are at least as many of them. And, um, and if you look at the, uh, the, the, the purple uh, column, second from the right, you'll see that Transport for London forecast a very substantial increase in congestion by 2031, I think it is. Um, yes, it is by 2031. Even if the, um, the transport projects and programs in the um, transport strategy which are funded take place, and if a whole lot of other projects and programs which at the moment have not received funding take place. So the quite um, benign assumptions made about this 14% about this um, um, big growth in congestion figure, but that, um, that, that is TFL's prediction in the transport strategy published, I think, last year. Um, TFL is sort of backtracking from that prediction to some extent now because the people in TFL whose job it is to apologize um, for the mayor's um, smoothing traffic flow program say, oh well, you know, we'll smooth traffic flow and then there won't be congestion and this 14% figure will not materialize. But I don't think um, that, that all, all, all the sort of participants in the debate are convinced by that argument. Um, and so what, 
do we think should be done about it? Um, and these are, the, these are what we suggest, sort of sitting in, our, in the office and coming up with what we think might be the, the, the most sensible things to do. There are some overarching points that we need to make. First of all, that, um, that interventions have to be pretty low cost given the squeeze on funding at the moment. That, um, that there's no point in trying to persuade mayoral candidates or anybody else that, um, that, that, that the answer for out of London is some sort of um, large extension to the tube network. Nobody's going to pay for it at the moment. Um, and, um, and secondly, the solutions have got to work with the existing um, with the existing land use pattern, and that's a help actually, not a hindrance. It's a good thing um, that there is a very polycentric pattern of land use in outer London, um, and and that you can set up um, what's called um, a, a, a city of villages where you know the, the town centres and other places act as sort of concentrations, locations for the services and amenities that people need. Um, and the third point I would make is that and, and, um, the, 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 the viability of, um, of uh, the express um, orbital public transport route was investigated by Transport for London, who you know, may have had a vested interest in it, they no doubt didn't want to pay for one, but they found that, um, that, that it wasn't viable, and that therefore um, you know, orbital transport should depend on some other means of getting around than, than a new express route connecting town centres in outer London. So we suggest um, four categories of measures now. Um, first of all, improving public transport. Um, that's not an easy thing to propose, I think, given that funding is limited. Secondly, um, implementing smart measures. Um, third, improving the public realm. And fourth, integrating planning and transport and now we'll deal with each of those in turn um, but as I say um, all of those things anyway have to work with the pattern of development in, in London and this is a diagram taken from the, um, the last report or the final report of the Mayor's Out of London um, Commission which had some reasonable things um, to say about transport and other things that were less so um, but this is, uh, is, 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 is okay. But this is, this is a stylized um, view of um, some, uh, some, some, some town centers and the transport patterns that might occur around them so that you can see that, um, that the, the, the green blobs of town centers in outer London, the gray in them is the, is the center of London. And, and, it's, and, and it really shows that you can make orbital journeys not necessarily by going between the green blobs themselves, though you can in some places where there are those dotted lines that might be bus routes or even in one or two cases railway lines. Um, but you can go um, into um, you know, a, a new, um, well, a, or a beefed up um, transport interchange. You go from the town centre, uh, the outer London town centre, to an interchange, the yellow circle, um, on the edge of inner London, that might be Wilson or Clapham or somewhere on the uh, on the uh, on the um, the new London Underground, the, the North London line, and then you can go round a bit and then hop out back to another place in outer London. Instead of going in as people had to do um, in the past, uh, and still do to a large extent, to a, a, a crowded central London uh, interchange like Kings Cross or uh, or Houston uh, you know, or one of uh, you know, any number of examples. Um, and then, uh, and so in reviewing public transport, we thought that uh, that that, um, we, we, that 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 thinking should focus on these matters particularly. But there should be a review of fares, um, with a view actually to making fares more affordable. Um, given that um, that um, that some bus fares have become pretty expensive, and that during the Boris era, um, pay-as-you-go bus um, bus fares have risen by 55 percent. That's in the last four years. Um, that um, that <coughs> travel has been made more expensive in London in other ways, 
Um, the Zone 6 um, travel card has been abolished so that you have to buy a Zone. Actually, I don't think it was a Zone 6. Was it a Zone 6? Two, 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 two to six, two. exactly. And, it, and it's been made a, a one to six now so that you have to pay for travel in inner London even if you don't want it. Um, and, um, and rail tickets, which a lot of people in outer London are dependent upon, um, are subject to a retail price index plus three um, increase uh, instead of RPI plus two, which is the, the, the principle that governs um, transport prices um, elsewhere. Uh, we also think that there's a lot of scope for um, cre creating more um, priority on, uh, on the bus network, the bus priority uh, and cycle priority indeed, on the, on, the, on the bus network, and for controlling uh, parking that impedes the passage of buses um, very often in the evenings and at weekends. I use a, a, a 134 um, quite often, and uh, you know, I notice that uh, on Saturdays and Sundays, um, the, the bus crawls into Muswell Hill because there's parking allowed on either side of the road for no very good reason other than the shopkeepers mistakenly believe that, it, that their, their, their continued existence and livelihood depends on the, uh, on the fact that some cars should be parked on either side of the road. Um, and, um, and, and, uh, and thirdly here, um, we think that there's probably scope for reforming the franchising of rail services. Uh, we're not alone in this. Um, the um, Transport for London and, and both mayors since 2000 have wanted to see the extension of, of, of mayoral authority over, um, over um, rail, the rail network in London. Um, and, uh, and the way that, that might happen is to, in order to provide um, a modern, um, a modern uh, rail um, system uh, along the lines of, um, of the London Underground that's been, of the London Overground that's been so successful uh, on the outer edge of inner London, or uh, yes, inner London. Uh, and, I mean, this is, this is just, sorry, I, I, I selected this slide because it seemed to illustrate this little whizzy, slightly whizzy nature of, um, of the London Underground network. Um, and, and, and the possibilities that are, are perhaps available for the rail network in, um, in, in outer London. If um, perhaps um, the, the, the use of a, of, a, of a gross cost contract was to be substituted for the present arrangement, which is a, a net cost contract, and, uh, and a gross cost contract, I believe, is one where um, the tendering authority, in this case Transport for London, um, pays the operator a set fee um, to operate a service. The operator collects the revenue and passes, um, and passes a, an agreed amount back to, the op to the, uh, back to the tendering authority. But in a gross contract, gross, gross, uh, I probably got it the wrong way around. I was trying to look up the, you know, what this meant this afternoon. I'm sure I, I, I fluffed it. But. Um, the, uh, the, the, anyway, um, a, a gross cost contract um, could probably go switching to that um, to that method could probably pay for uh, or help at least pay for um, for bringing a, a unified network into 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 the sort of branding and marketing that's used by TF elsewhere could help integrate timetabling, ticketing, and information with the rest of TFL's systems. Um, it could help the um, oyster to be available across the network uh, and, and it could lead to um, an improvement in stations obviously. Um, local authorities have a role to play there too in, um, in ensuring that, that stations become more accessible um, for pedestrians and cyclists with more cycle parking and so on and, and, and more accessible to people with, people with, to people with disabilities. Um, and, and smart measures, you probably know about, that, uh, that, that the big example um, of this uh, in London was the Smart Travel in Sutton scheme. Um, though there was the Sustainable Transport Towns sort of project that, uh, that occurred um, uh, 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 elsewhere in, uh, in England. 
And, and in Saturn, it, 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 it consisted mainly of school and workplace travel plans. I can explain those, but you probably know what they are. Personalized uh, travel advice and, um, and, and marketing and information. And uh, advertising and marketing and promotion, usually, uh, in this case, by the local authority. Uh, also, the promotion of car clubs, car sharing, cycle parking, and other measures. But those, I think, are the main ones. And, and, and that had very good effects in, in, in Sutton. Um, it was found to increase um, cycling by 75% um, to, uh, to produce a 17 to 16% increase in bus passengers, a 6% a reduction in car mode share, a 3% increase in walking, and a 5% fall in pupils going to school by car. Richmond, it was decided, would um, would be this would succeed Sutton in um, in trying out this scheme, um, but that was in its um, Lib Dem days, and uh, and 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 um, the uh, the smart travel Richmond became something of an ideological issue, and um, and was abandoned um, by the uh, by the incoming um, Conservative uh, administration. After I think uh, one and a half years or so, um, so there is no smart travel any borough program at the moment. Um, and thirdly, um, in, we, we would propose to improve public realm. And you've talked about this a lot here with people with much more authority than than uh, than, than we have. Um, but um, cycling so could do much more to um, to increase cycling, and we all know how. How pathetically little cycling goes on in outer London, and how really this is the mode with the greatest uh, potential um, for uh, for growth, and the and the greatest potential actually to prevent the sort of um, the the increase in congestion that we've talked about, um, and at the same time to relieve um, the 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 pressure on uh, or the growing pressure on the on the public transport uh, network, which despite the record levels of money going into it won't be able to handle um, the, uh, the amount of additional traffic that will result from a, mi a million extra people living in London in the next 20 years and, uh, and, uh, and seven or 800,000 additional jobs that they were once saying, I don't know whether they say that with quite such confidence now, would, um, would, 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 would be provided. Um, and secondly, um, here we, we see that there's a lot that can be done to recognise um, the importance of pedestrians and cycling and cyclists to, um, to town centre economies. And um, Transport for London has done at least three projects since 2000 um, to, um, to investigate the amount of money that's spent um, by people in town centres, by, by people who arrive uh, by different modes of transport. And they've always found um, that, um, that pedestrians and cyclists, in fact, spend more than people who come um, to town centres by car. And yet, um, shopkeepers in those town centres think that, uh, that parking is essential um, to their business um, and, uh, uh, and, so, um, and, and under, uh, underrate the, the importance of uh, pedestrians and cyclists amongst their customers. Um, and, uh, and thirdly here, um, the, the, we obviously feel that, um, that, that the needs of pedestrian cyclists and public transport needs to be, uh, need to be um, uh, prioritised on the roads. This isn't the way that Boris is going. It was quite a big issue in the, um, in the examination in public in the London plan. Um, whether Boris um, would, um, would agree to... Um, to uh, endorse the, uh, the hierarchy of road users, which places uh, pedestrians first, and cyclists second, and, um, and public transport users third. And, um, and the inspectors, in fact, agreed that he should do this, um, and recommended accordingly. Um, but, um, uh, but and, and some sort of recognition of their recommendation was made in the London plan in the end, but stopping short of endorsing the hierarchy of road users, and so this remains a demand that, uh, that, that has yet to be met. 
Um, and in practice, these things mean um, a filtered permeability um, and a better routes to town and local centres for, uh, walk, for walking and cycling. A default 20 mile an hour limit is pretty a fundamental um, demand. Um, and the removal of one way systems, still a lot of those, uh, particularly in town centres, and I imagine London now has elsewhere. Um, and the implementation of shared space schemes like um, that, that the, the one that uh, where the cut is the one example, the big example I suppose is, uh, is, is exhibition rooms that's being built at the moment. I, I don't know about the London examples, but there must be some perhaps not as good. Cotton Garden, exactly. Yeah. But those are all in a in a London or central London in fact, I don't know. I don't know. No. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and a lot can be done um, to, um, to, to reduce the impact of traffic on main roads. We had a program a few years ago that was called New Life for Main Roads, and various projects were implemented under that. Um, on, on the, in that scheme, one in, on, in the Walworth, on the Walworth Road and, uh, and others in other parts of the country. Uh, and that consisted mainly of slowing traffic, um, clearing the street, clutter, removing guardrails, widening pavements, reallocating road space to um, to non-car, non-traffic uses, um, providing um, additional crossing places, and 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 the uh, and, and it sort of um, in, uh, included a, the philosophy, the philosophy about about enhancing the quality of a place. Um, rather than its function as a link in the, in the transport network. Um, and, and at the moment, uh, you, this is still a sort of continuing, um, a continuing um, debate and conflict um, between, between recognizing um, the place, the social place function of a lot of high streets and, and other um, prominent places of, of, on the pub, uh, in, in the public realm and uh, and its um, and its um, and its role in um, in, in, um, in traffic, uh, in, in 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 allowing traffic movement, um, and that that is becoming uh, and its sort of its traffic function is is becoming more pronounced in the Boris era as he tries um, to smooth traffic, which many of us see as meaning um, increasing traffic and allowing more of it um, on the on the road network. But um, New Life for Main Road sort of projects have occurred in, uh, in, in, in High Street, Kensington. Obviously, that was it. That's one of the best known examples, but others have been in Barking, Cotton Garden, you, you mentioned um, Brick, Brick Lane uh, on the Walworth Road. And I think there was a scheme mooted for, for tooting. Uh, I don't know whether it happened or not. Uh, perhaps somebody else could say. Um, and fourthly, um, we suggest that, uh, that quite a lot um, can and, and, and should be done um, in the area of integrating transport and planning. And, and another way of putting it is to reduce the, the need to travel or to increase the number and the lengths of journeys that people need to make in order to, uh, in order to conduct their lives. Um, this goes under various names, one that's um, quite widely used in America as transit-oriented development, um, also known as um, smart growth, or, or, or more simply as sort of compact community um, um, philosophy. Um, and, and a lot of that is to do with where development is located, so that, um, so that major employment, leisure, and retail developments should be located um, in town centers uh, and not necessarily the major town centres, as we'll see, but uh, could be in smaller town centres. They should be um, on the public transport network and not on the road network. And I think we saw in this slide on Brent Cross, uh, it's um, located right beside um, the, the North Circular Road, where the North Circular Road actually has about 14 lanes. It's phenomenal. You can stand on a bridge there and look down on... I think at least 14 lanes of traffic. It's also right beside the M11 um, on the on the west, the M1, sorry, to the west, and uh, the A40, A41, 421 to the east. So you know, it's a, it's 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 located 
um, precisely because of the uh, of of its position on the on the road network and access by public transport is appalling. It needs to be the other way around. Um, and and then residential development houses um, or or homes. Um, should be located near the services and amenities that might be concentrated in town or, um, or, or district centres or local centres, uh, as we'll come on to. Yeah, the, this is, uh, the, the key principle um, must be um, to enhance accessibility, um, and, uh, and, and that can be done by focusing on the town, district and neighbourhood centres. Now, this is a map of London showing the, uh, the, uh, the, the major district centres, so that the major centres are the likes of Sutton and, uh, and Croydon and Bromley in the south, of uh, Harrow and Romford and Wood Green in the north, um, and, the, and the little um, grey uh, gray, gray blobs are the, are the, uh, the, the district centres. What isn't shown on that map, and is probably of great or greater importance, is the far larger number of, uh, of, uh, of local or neighbourhood centres, uh, of which there are, you know, the, I mean, there, there are three or four near where, within walking distance of where I live, local groups of shops or parades of local shops, which could also be the location for, um, and are um, often the location for um, a doctor's surgery or a library or, or a post office, whilst they still exist, um, and, uh, and those sorts of things. Um, and, um, and, <coughs> and, and the question of density also is of uh, crucial importance, so that you provide the higher densities at, uh, at the town centres and the transport hubs, and thus helping to support um, transport services, um, if any support were needed for those in, in London, they generally, they generally have uh, support anyway. Uh, but uh, the local services that people want to have um, within um, walking and cycling distance um, and reducing um, car travel, both distance travelled uh, and, uh, and, the, uh, and uh, the, the share of trips made by car. <coughs> And this is a, another stylized diagram from a com Commission for Integrated Transport report uh, uh, showing um, the, the major, um, a, 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 a district, if you like, um, centre at the centre of, uh, of those circles, uh, which has the um, darkest colour because it is the highest density. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's on a, a, on a rail line from outside the urban area, which you could say is outside London in this case, and leading towards the centre. And, uh, and the, and the, and the lo more local or neighbourhood centres dotted around it, um, less, um, less uh, densely uh, developed, uh, but still more densely than the hinterland, um, and they are connected to each other and to the uh, and to the district or main or major centre by bus services, uh, and also, but not depicted in this diagram, by a, a very fine uh, network of walking uh, and uh, and cycling routes, um, and uh, and that's uh, and that's the, the sort of land use pattern I think that isn't really being promoted in London. There are policies in favour of it. But uh, because um, there are forces working against it, it doesn't happen. And those forces are the sort of traffic generating large catchment area things that go on and a failure to protect, to protect um, local services and amenities. It's another view of that, um, of, that, um, of that type of design where above the, uh, the, the, the thick uh, gray line, um, you have an inappropriate style of development, which is um, you know, circular road layouts that lead nowhere, um, and, um, and and cul-de-sacs again, taking you nowhere. Perhaps okay for driving around. Um, you know, they, they prevent um, high, higher traffic speeds. I suppose that's why often they were uh, sort of uh, endorsed in the first place. Be useless for walking and, and cycling. And that's and they that sort of development might rely on the shopping facility that's depicted in the top left hand corner which is a 
uh, you know, a, a major shopping development, probably surrounded with car parking, but the, um, the nature of the white square there is not explained. Um, and, uh, and it contrasts with, with the sort of development you see below the line, where you have a permeable um, street uh, network, and, um, and, uh, which could be walked and cycled very easily, and, 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 and shopping and local facilities located in the, uh, in, the, in the high street, which is that orange cross in, in the middle. Also, um, good access to public, to, uh, to open space. Um, so, finally, um, travel demand measures um, need to be applied to existing development. I think a lot of the discussion that occurs about, about land use and planning is unfortunately about uh, about uh, what sort, uh, about how, what sort of uh, development decisions and development policies there should be for new development. And, uh, and the problem is obviously that there is far more existing development, uh, and so you've got to devise policies that apply to, um, to existing development. And, uh, and, and travel demand measures can be applied to existing development and should be. Uh, I think some of the other um, policies can be adapted for existing development. And certainly, you could control parking um, in new developments um, much, more, uh, much more than is happening at the moment. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, in exist and, and there could be parking schemes for existing developments, and generally popular uh, residence parking permits and so on after they've been implemented, if they're not um, beforehand. Uh, and you could restrain schemes with large catchments and large amounts of parking, such as Stratford and Brent Cross. Thank you. That's uh, I'll hand, hand back to, to Richard now to, to finish off. Oh, thanks. Um, the last bit is just a bit of kind of for, for conversation and, and discussion afterwards, um, which is really about how can we bring around these changes? Because what we've been talking about is kind of is, is known in many ways. Um, we've been making the case for, for a number of years about those things, but actually bringing that out is quite difficult. And part of that is also um, trying to make the case that, that, that um, channel behaviour can change. Um, it's often the seen as the sort of given that people just, just will drive, and that kind of guys all the politicians thinking about it. But they have looked at these simple travel towns and smarter choices programmes, and also things like uh, the Oyster Card itself um, shows, and the congestion chart shows that channel behaviour does change. There's also, I think, lots of evidence about how channel behaviour is, is changing anyway, the kind of ideas around peak car, where in the Western kind of developed countries, we're seeing a fall in the distance travelled, and particularly amongst young people, we're seeing a changing attitude towards driving and towards ownership of cars. There's more interest in the idea of, of, of car clubs and having access to mobility, access to transport, not necessarily owning it. Um, but to, to bring that about, we need leadership, obviously, with the congestion charge. It was sort of taken through by, by clear leadership, not necessarily something that, that um, was done by, by focus group. But I think we also think that, that actually you need to have um, for our London, we need to kind of have um, ownership by the boroughs themselves as well, so it's not simply the kind of imposed agenda on them. And also for the neighbourhoods themselves to be able to take forward ideas. And I think part of it is trying to make sure, that, that, or trying to reflect also, that um, out of London is a key background for the mayoral election next year. It's where most of the voters are. Um, it's where the swing voters are. It's where both, both the, the, the two main candidates will focus their attention. So it's just sort of evidence about why what we're talking about will actually be benefits to out of London in terms of doing this an independent life and protecting local shops and services. So the idea that we've been talking to policymakers about into the parties is about um, uh, a kind of London suburbs transport fund. Um, nationally, there's something called the Local Disabled Transport Fund, which is uh, about £560 million for uh, transport authorities outside London to put in place sustainable transport measures. Uh, we think that something similar could work in out of London, where it's a kind of fund that you bid to when you have ideas for, for, for what you can do in, in out of London to, to reduce traffic. Um, so we see it as a kind of catalyst for action. It could build on the, the local implementation plans. It could build on, on Boris's out of London fund. But what we'd be asking to see is um, look, the out of London boroughs putting forward proposals uh, around action, around uh, public transport, so things like links around stations, improving the links to the town centres between stations, uh, perhaps more water developments around stations, uh, putting in place bus lanes. In terms of smarter choices, it seems like work, workplace travel plans and smarter working. Um, we think that there are low-cost public realm measures as well. Sustrans have been running a very good 
project called DIY Streets, which has been demonstrating the kind of low cost things that you can do to actually improve the public realm and, and change travel yeah. behaviour. And then in terms of planning, it's about putting in place accessibility plans to improve uh, people's access to local local services. But we think this isn't the kind of time for, for massive spending. Um, this is a graph that shows what's happening to local transport spending. Um, the, the solid lines are the local transport authorities outside London. They've had massive cuts in 2011-2011 and 2011-12. The dotted line is transport for London. Um, and you can see um, the cuts don't come in until after the mayoral elections next year, and then there's a sudden decline. Um, I'm sure that wasn't delivered by the uh, Treasury. Uh, um, so there isn't going to be the money available for the kind of the big Crossrail 2, Crossrail 3. And actually, if you want to change travel behaviour, we don't simply want to respond to ever increasing demands for travel. If you want to do something about improving the public realm, improving uh, how out London feels as, as a place to live and work, and actually the kind of smaller scale initiatives are what we need to see. But we need to make sure that, that the boroughs are putting forward those proposals. And we also, I think, need to see that we can enhance the status of sustainable travel in outer London as well. So the kinds of people who are working in outer London boroughs on, on sustainable travel, the kind of people who are leading on cycling. Actually, if we can attach a pot of money, which they're the ones who are bidding for, we can enhance their status within the, the, the boroughs. And I think that will be very important in terms of, of, of shifting the, the agenda in outer London. It has been a big focus on, on inner London with the congestion charge, with the big public realm type schemes that we've seen in, in, in inner London. And actually, outer London is where the real opportunities are to shift behaviour. And it will bring benefits to both outer London and inner London in terms of people driving through inner London from outer London. And I think it will provide real opportunities. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about to uh, the political parties ahead of the mayoral elections. Um, but afterwards, we really need to have your ideas about what you think needs to happen in outer London and the kind of things we should be saying uh, to Boris and Ken and Brian Paddock uh, and Jenny Jones as well. So I'm uh, pleased to tell us your ideas afterwards. Well, uh, thank you, Richards. Um, <coughs> Yeah, uh, so ideas and discussion in, um, in about 15 minutes uh, at time. Um, just uh, grab a drink in a sec. But before we do that, um, just to uh, mention next uh, month's street talk, uh, which will be uh, on the 6th of December at Look Mum No Hands, not here. Uh, don't come here, somebody will be having a Christmas party. <laughs> By the way, maybe you should come here. Um, uh, but. Um, the idea is that we're giving uh, the, you, the audience, who normally uh, sits here so patiently listening, uh, a chance to, to share your thoughts on, on making a more livable London. So if, you, uh, if you've got ideas uh, for that and want to give a short uh, seven and a half minute presentation, then please uh, go to the website and, uh, and, and send us a, a note on, on what you'd uh, like to speak to. Um, and uh, Richard Bourne um, quite neatly reminded us of one of his slides. Um, uh, the issue of shared space came up, uh, which will be the, the topic for uh, the first street talk of, um, uh, of next year, uh, 2012. And uh, back here, uh, don't go to look my hands, come here. Um, and, and he also mentioned 20 miles an hour, um, which uh, prompts me to remind you all, if you haven't done so, to support um, the uh, Sustrans and Living Streets led uh, campaign for 20 miles an hour on all uh, mayoral roads through. Um, uh, town centres, uh, those centres that, uh, that Richard mentioned, uh, and, and the other streets where people uh, live and work. Um, so that's it. Uh, like I said, grab a drink and, um, uh, and we'll come back in about 10 15 minutes for, uh, for a discussion. Thanks. So, uh, any any questions for the two Richards or uh, thoughts on? Um, uh, 
shut up because I haven't got up already. So we'll just start, <laughs> we'll start with that. Just a, a quick one. Um, where's the money and impetus for the organisation come from? Well, I get the impression it's a membership led organisation like LCC. So, let, yeah, where's the push from? Where's the money? Uh, for us, we get funding from. Uh, charitable trusts and individuals, you also get some funding from uh, transport operators as well. So it's a mix of people, but we have individual supporters, and that's the kind of growing source of income for the organisation. We're not very big though, we have about uh, 14 staff, I think it is now. 14 staff is quite a lot, but I don't know that membership is. So, I mean, how much of the money does come from transport operators? Uh, I think it's around a third, third to 40 percent, and then uh, we get funding, part of that is uh, Passenger Transport Executive Group, which is like TfL groups outside London, and we get some money from TfL, and the most of it, the more well, large source of income is people like the SMA Fairbairn Foundation and charitable trusts like that. I think there's more scope for orbital public transport than uh, you give credit for. I mean, there are difficulties, of course, and to have a complete circle is probably not on the cards at the moment, but there are certain areas, like the proposal for the fast bus in West London, and also, uh, or, or a, a similar system for a light rail system on a similar corridor that we in the London group of Campaign for Better Transport have been campaigning for. So, I mean, there aren't scope like that. And also, I mean, there is an orbital bus uh, from Heathrow to Croydon, that is very popular, and that could connect with the tram uh, to Beckenham and with the train to Bromley, and you get quite a lot. The, the problem about it is that they're not linked together, and they're not branded, and so they're not looked at as kind of uh, complete orbital systems. But there's a, there's quite a lot of scope if one could push for it to be more publicised. I can chip in on that. We were just talking, we were just reminiscing about that bus just now because that used to be the, a green line. Yeah. Big coach called a 726. We used to go from Bromley and Sidcup all the way around Heathrow, and it was pretty popular. I guess, uh, I guess it's partly back on how you, you brand those things as well. So, I, mean, I think what, what Richard was saying was about the kind of big, expensive infrastructure building, the kind of corporate line. The kind of things about joining it up by, by integrating the ticketing and integrating the brand, and things like that, are aware of it. There's, there is obviously there are opportunities there for that. Uh, and, and I remember a proposal by Nicky Gavron for um, for bus lanes on the North Circular Road for express bus services, and uh, you know I think that, that there's a probably scope for that sort of proposal as well to provide an orbital uh, service between the uh, outer London uh, centres. I think it was just it was a question I had as well. Was when they said no. No viability for express services. Is that express bus services or, or, or light rail? I was or just else? when Rick was speaking, just I was thinking exactly that same the same thing. Actually, I'm not sure. And, it, it, um, it was all awesome. 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 It was all the next 26, and I don't think it worked in practice. Yeah. Um, and for some reason, the forest is tied. Decided not to go. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just say, actually, while I'm on the subject, I don't think branding is something to actually because. When I tap into my iPhone app, that one goes from A to B, I don't care who, who's providing it in London. It's part of the Oyster Park, it's going to get no fairness, and the uh, brand side is less of an issue. Um, and while I'm on the subject of Sutton, I have just uh, bring something to, uh, to light about the smart travel of the Sutton initiative, this travel behaviour program that Richard uh, B mentioned, which is a five million program over two and a half years, which is, is very successful. And it's the figure for 75 percent increase in cycling has to be benefits the very low base. Yeah. It's, it's more like four cycles becoming seven. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. about yeah. like seven to thousand. So we need to get back to you know it's a separation Back. Thank you. Yes, so, so the London plan has lots of great aspirations in it, right? For sustainable transport, even with the watering down and happening the loss of the IRP provision. But there doesn't seem to be a mechanism for forcing the boroughs to enact it. So I live in Barnet who just ignore it completely. Yeah. But how do you see that working? Like, like if I, if, you know, as part of the local LCC group in Barnet, we would like to apply some pressure on Boris Johnson, maybe to crack the whip a bit over the heads of the people in Barnet and see if we can get something put in. Well, I think how do you see that working? Because there's all these sort of things that look great, but the mechanism actually is just dysfunctional. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. 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 I suppose the London plan um, it, it is intended to, uh, to, to determine what happens with, uh, with development policies and development decisions. And it leaves um, you know, existing development um, untouched. If, sure, if, if Barry's choose that, that should be so. The in providing a target, the bar is supposed to work towards, right? That, that's what the London plan is, like, here's where you're supposed to get to, yes? But, but Boris has removed any control over how the bar has spent their money, right? So, so you can give them the money and they're just supposed to increase cycling, so they buy it. That means repaving roads are widening them because they're nice to drive them, right? And also increase the traffic speed. So, so there's no real mechanism for an act of the London plan that's going to go fast. So, so how, how do you, you know, from your position, how would one best apply pressure? Well, I, I think it, I think it is. You know, there there are retrograde transport policies in, within the, within the London plan, and so you can't expect that the policies uh, in the London transport strategy, which goes into these matters in more detail, to be um, to be terribly enlightened or progressive. But, but if I were enacted the London plan, we'd be thrilled. Right. Well, well, I, I, don't think that's, I don't really think that's entirely wanted. true. I think there's good and bad in the London plan, and, uh, and I think it is quite good on, uh, on land use and the integration of transport and land use planning. But I think on pure uh, transport policy, it's pretty awful. And I mean, one of the things which I mentioned was its failure um, to endorse the hierarchy of road users, and there are others. I mean, it relaxed um, parking standards. Um, all, uh, all over the place and it allows more parking in town centres where that's considered... I, I agree with that actually, but isn't it academic, right? If, if there's no mechanism for Well, I don't think it is academic and I think, I think actually you, you will probably see that um, some out of London local authorities will make a case for providing additional parking in town centres and that will contribute towards the realisation of the 14% of growth in traffic congestion um, in the next 20 years. I mean, I would like it to be otherwise, but um, I but fear there is, there is a point about how do you apply pressure on those, on those boroughs who are yeah. doing, doing that. Yeah. 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 And there's watered down measures in the London plan with respect to sanity transport, leaving aside the parking, which you're quite right about that, leaving, leaving that aside. Even what's there now is much, much, much better than what Barnett are currently proposing. Yeah, I, mean, right. so, so, I believe that. Yes, yeah. yes, and there's no mechanism at all by which the mayor can force them to, to go with the London plan. Yeah, mm. but the mayor has never actually attempted to, um, not, neither um, Livingston nor Boris has attempted to sort of, to, sort of in, to, to force any borough to comply with mayoral policies. Right. And, I, can, um, I, can, I can challenge that because in Greenwich they tried to um, build a gyratory um, around the town centre and TFL refused funding for it because it was gyratory. But there was, there was a there was, there was quite a lot of for quite a long time Barnet was in conflict with um, with Livingston, and yet um, in the settle in the in the annual settlement the LIPS local implementation plan funding I think it, actually it was the wasn't because that happens every few years but it was the, the transport settlement that boroughs get. Um, but Barnet got exactly the same money as all other um, London boroughs, and, and I just wondered whether, where was you know was was, was there evidence of Livingston um, trying to uh, oblige Barnet to comply with his policies? I didn't see any. My understanding, my understanding is that under Livingston, TFL have gave money to the boroughs as part of the LRP process, but there was a, a proviso that give you money for cycle parking. You need to put some cycle parking with it, right? And then we see that's done, get some money for something else. There was some degree of ring fence. I think Boris has removed that, actually. So, so now he just gives the money and says, we'd like to see an increase in cycling of 10% by the next 20 years. And, and you just have to do it. So. I think so. I mean, one of the reasons we were talking about having a local a London set, London, London Settlers Transport Fund was making it more about bidding for funding. So in a sense, if Barnet didn't apply for that funding and, and, and just forego it, and it's high cost to them. Whereas if they were to, to bid for that funding, they would, they would need to demonstrate uh, action around these kind of the four areas that we, did, we suggested. And I think that's one of the ways to do it. Because you're not necessarily forcing them to do something, but they're going to miss out on that money if they don't put forward proposals to do that. Whereas at the moment with local implementation plans, they are just getting funding for whatever they, 
Well, they do judge on end results rather than process. So, so how are you achieve increase in cycling is relevant to TFL. They're interested in do you achieve increase in cycling at some point in the future. That's, I think that's the new system. I I'm going to take a, uh, some yeah. more questions. So, uh, yeah, so you know. Actually, it was directly related to that. Um, as I understood it, um, TFL, as you say, have relaxed some boundaries. They put two pots into one or something. Yes. I can't remember what they're called. But the long and short of it is that the smart travel funding is not sort of like specified. So it's basically up to each borough whether they want to spend money on smart travel and if they do. So that means there's a huge role for local you know, local groups in each borough to say, look, you know, this is a priority. You've got to spend your money, you know, this pot should be spent prioritised on um, smart travel. Okay, but there's nothing to force the boroughs to take no. the money, right? So, so, no, so in the exactly. case, they cut cycle um, training, yeah. they cut cycle parking, they cut cycle lanes. It's external funding. Yeah. It's, not, it's not money that they have to find. Well, they can choose to yeah. put it on something else. But what I was also going to say is that, as I understand it, um, on air pollution, I gather you had a, a talk a couple of months ago from Simon Birkin, yeah. and you know there is there is a huge overlap, obviously, between you know the, the things we want to see from climate change and on air pollution in terms of what you can do with with, with transport and cutting levels. There's a bit of difficulty about diesel engines, but you know air pollution is a really good way in to try and get some of the changes because. You know, there's a real, there's a real sort of stick hanging over, you know, the government and the mayor and, and, and local authorities about kind of thing. And I understand that, that the mayor is talking to each borough about something called an air quality implementation plan. So I know you just sort of spotted that on some TFL um, board paper, but um, I think that that's that's something that they're all going to have to do. So um, that might be a really good way to sort of have a go at them. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting talk. I picked up on the fact you, you mentioned a couple of times that shopkeepers are quite uh, anti any, any measures to restrict traffic. I think another way in, as well as air pollution, is, is making the economic case. I mean, I, I don't actually think that that's the most important thing, but I think the people that tend to block sustainable transport policy tend to be the ones that are focused on economic growth and they associate car use with economic growth. And I think what someone needs to do, and Campaign for Public Transport might be the ideal organisation to do it, is put together all the evidence which demonstrates why more sustainable travel would actually be good for economic growth. Because I believe firmly it would be. You, know, it's, you get more people in, you get cleaner air, you, you know, there's lots of economic cost associated with all the the externalities of our current transport system. And in urban areas, then I think you'd, you'd make a pretty watertight case. And then you'd convince the people that are blocking it, because it, you know, a lot of the, the, the Greens and, and the Mid-Domes may be on side already. It's the uh, other areas that, that need to convince it. Yeah, I mean, it's something we're looking to do at the moment, uh, particularly around kind of road schemes. So um, there's lots of interest in national governments about putting money into road schemes to boost the economy. So we can make the argument that actually that's not the way to do it. It doesn't create the jobs you want. It doesn't support local economies, which is what you need. And particularly in Outer London, I think it's about kind of trying to, to, to make the case for, for more independent economic life in Outer London as well. So it's not simply dormitory suburbs where everyone is coming to sort of work. Actually, about how do we support businesses outside the centre? And in some ways, the Outer London Fund for Boris is, is, a, is a start. It's about trying to support it. The high streets out outside London. Let's just try and have an independent life for those areas. I think it would be really important. Um, John? Yeah, it's, I suppose the question is about leverage for either of you, I suppose. And it comes back to the, the point that was raised there, that the final bullet point up there about number one being the key background to the election, which is there is a real challenge with, 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 with lip time. You can just about spend it on sweets if you wish. There is, you know, and that was one of the key things that changed when Boris came in, which is. You know, the, 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 the issue you're talking about now has got, obviously got a lot harder when Boris came in because of the reaction from out of London to Kent. So there was, there was a lot of bending of the back. I remember working for uh, Enfield many years ago. They were frightened to death because their cabinet member did not want to spend the money they had got on for bus priority on bus priority, and they were just going to get it clawed back. It doesn't apply. If you did spend it on suites or you know, transport suites, 
you know, it, it doesn't work. So you don't have much leverage through that. And I suppose that the, the bullet point there about key battleground for, for the election, well, yeah, as well it is, but actually isn't one of the problems we have is that actually it gives it to us. You know, people are going to vote and have to vote with their cars at the moment, or their car ownership, or whatever it might be. So although Apple London is a key battleground for election, do you really think you can make transport, better transport now for London, something that will really unsettle some politicians there? I think it's about how you frame that, that debate, so it's not about greening transport. It's about the kind of issues that people care about in out of London, which is sort of speeding cars, safety of their kids walking to school, those kinds of issues, or but also the quality of the local local high streets as well. Those are the kind of key issues to fight it on, and it's about making a case for that. So it's making a kind of economic case that don't feel the same. Can I, can I just go back to that? Because actually, I, I think it's an excellent point, which you sort of turn from a slightly broader issue about economic growth. But one the one when you mentioned that, you said, oh, there we go again, the number of people are actually being involved with, they just don't believe you, shop owners. Mm -hmm. And actually, because that, so that, I thought that idea of what can an organisation like yours do, because there's quite a lot of, I mean, there was a, a report, I remember when I used to work at London Borough Review many years ago, Big Spenders by Bus was a report done by, you, I, I won't find it for you if you don't know, but I won't know. But, but it was, it was a look through London about how much of the shops didn't realise how many, you know, because they bought me bags, but they bought several bags and several trips. First TFL in 2001, just before. But, but that kind of thing so that actually for, for campaigners, practitioners, whatever, there is a ready resource to say, no, actually, you're wrong. <laughs> so, and that would be particularly helpful in that local high street level. I think so. I think there's a good approach to it. Um, Peter Jones, who was here earlier, and we did the link in place work <coughs> of actually assessing the kind of the impact of, of the transport on the road network, the red routes, and, and actually thinking about how you could change those a bit to support where there are shops as well. And that's the kind of thing which perhaps might appeal to the boroughs where it's a little bit of bashing TFL about support, and it's trying to find those ways into to, to, to making the case in, in the outlined boroughs. There's a gentleman at the back of you still got uh, Yeah, um, just a very quick observation on both all the points that have been made. I live in Bromley, um, and yesterday I went to um, an exhibition by Bromley Council on the redevelopment and basically an attempt to try and get more money out of Bromley North, which is kind of it's become a shithole by the expression. Um, in the very north, you know, they've got the sand, they've got the, they've got the glades, they've got all the, the very specific stuff that you've talked about, the out of town shopping centre, thousands of parks, and whatever, and they've realised that the north is dying. Um, and actually, I would encourage everybody who's talked about economics and whatever to look at what they're doing there because it seems to work with a lot of the things you've said. Um, you know, there is a consultation period, I'm sure lots of people will get involved in the consultation period, but the drastically reducing the traffic flow through three or four major streets through the heart of the, of the town is on their agenda making the pavements much, much bigger, making certain roads one way, which are like, I know you said, one of those streets are not the be all and end all. But that's a substantial change for them, and they're putting substantial money that they're actually getting from the outlet. I think it's all about five million quid they're putting into it. And, you know, quite a radical departure for what is actually quite a staid, old-fashioned town, and it's the old-fashioned part of the old-fashioned town. So, it isn't always the case that all these councils are blinkered and whatever, no great friend of Tory councils, but there is seemingly to me, and I'm no expert in the ways that you guys are, a lot of good work happening there. Um, and eventually, it's, I understand the shopkeepers are behind it because they're dying up there. You know, I mean, having a shop up there is equivalent of being, you know, going out of business in three to six months, and there's lots and lots of um, empty shop fronts. So they're all behind it, even though it means they're going to cut out parking and they're going to put in a bigger pedestrian and they're going to put in place for cafes to have tables out the front, which doesn't really happen probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that is like, the, it is an opportunity, the fact that places are fading is an opportunity to do something about it. And there is a willingness often amongst Conservative Party councillors as well to, 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 to think about that. And they are, there is a general thing in the Conservative Party to be in favour of, of town centres. Uh, it doesn't seem late. It's not always put into practice. And if you look at the National Planning Policy Framework, it doesn't really do that. 
there is still that kind of nostalgia <coughs> for the town centre, for the high street that you can, you can build on. But also it's about thinking like, um, like Richard was talking about uh, in terms of trying to, to have higher density around town centres, about higher density around public transport interchanges as well. And one of the things that, that we're interested in is about <coughs> The, the rail network in South London as well. So TfL reckon that car use is about 10% higher in South London because, because it's a, South London relies on the rail network and it's not marketed well, it's not a service that, that is run to the same levels as, as the underground or the overground service. And that's why they want to get their hands on the network in South London. And there are probably opportunities to actually think about the stations in South London and making them more hubs for the local community or for the local economy. Um, and, and that's the kind of opportunity that, that we think should be taken as well. Well, that's just my very last one, of course, Shah. Um, is that the thing is talking about branding and marketing and these various different things. It really doesn't matter. The fact remains, if you want to get from London to Bromley North, where we live, you have to get a little hopper train. There's like two hopper trains on an off peak when you get off at Grove Park. Okay? So if you miss that, then you're waiting around for um, quite a long period of time. So you walk to the front of the park and you think, I'm going to get a bus. The bus is going to match up. So you're waiting 20 minutes for a bus and then you're running back and you're getting on the hopper train. It's madness. <laughs> Somebody just has to look at the timetable and think, well, if, if we put a bus like maybe five minutes after that train arrives, we might pick up lots of people on the bus. Just to me it beggars belief. You don't need a branding, you don't need anything. You just need to make it so that the, the, everything overlaps in an integrated way. Yeah. Uh I mean, we, we, we can be saying that since we were founded in 1973. <laughs> uh, but part of it is also that there isn't necessarily the incentives for train operating companies to grow demand. They're not that interested in it. Well, some things. Yeah, whereas for TFL, there is because they want to get traffic off the road. They're, they are an integrated transport authority, so it's in their interest to do something about traffic and do something about growth, about integrating with the various roads. They don't always do it perfectly, but there's more chance of that happening, I think, than there is <coughs> having, having train operating companies on short, short franchises where they're interested in, in delivering what they've agreed in the franchise, not in terms of growing demand for rail or making best use of the network they've got. Um, one thing I, I um, thought the presentation earlier suffered from slightly was, I think, a lack of definition in actually where we're talking about. Um, the definition on the first line of outer London included the west side of Kilburn High Road, which is particularly suburban to me. Um, yeah, because it could be busy, it depends on the old kind of definition of outer and inner London boroughs, and the following side it switched, uh, I think it switched Greenwich and Harringay between outer and inner London boroughs. So I just wonder, you know, where, where exactly are we talking about here? And if we're looking at defining where we're talking about, then surely we should be looking at, say, giving TfL an expanded role just outside London to places like Dartford, heading out towards where the Blue Water Shopping Centre is, um, Grays, places like that, Watford. Because if you're trying to convince people in somewhere like Bexley Heath or Crayford or, or Sidcup to, to, you know, to, to get the bus, if they want to go to Blue Water, bus service is crap. Well, the, the, I, th I think the, 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 there, is, there is a difficulty with the definition of outer and, and, and inner London. And one is that there are obviously sort of suburban areas of inner London where access to um, the public transport network and the facilities is poor. And there are parts of outer London where, um, where, 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 which are in, you know, very intensely developed and where there's very good public transport and good facilities and amenities. So you know, they, they, they aren't completely se separated geographically. And what you say um, about uh, beyond the London borders is also true. And I, I think the, the, the Bear um, already has some um, degree of statutory um, authority over, uh, over services uh, beyond the London borders, <coughs> and no doubt TfL and, and the Mayor would like more, so, um, you know, and obviously what happens beyond London um, is, uh, is, is, is important within the London borders, so I, I agree with you. Um, one, of, one of the things we started doing work on when we started this was about sort of different typologies of suburban areas as well. And I guess there are more opportunities in the kind of traditional Victorian railway suburbs where transport behaviour is, is quite different to later boroughs, later suburbs. Um, uh, our car ownerships are, are lower. And the kind of it, a lot of it, I think, will be about the, the, how can you change the design almost of, of classic, or of real sort of 
post-war, interwar, post-war suburban areas where it is much more designed around the car. And it's, it's the kind of, there's, there's all the stuff about sort of nudge theory about pushing people, but it's also about the kind of the clues you get from inside the places the way you live. Where if it's full of crossovers to parking in front of people's front gardens, that just tells you everything is about this is an area of the car, it's built to pay for parking. And I think that's where it would be interesting to think about what low cost things you can do to start to change the, the, the design of those areas. So it's not something sort of default that you just, just think you take the car. I think, so to, to come back, but then, um, I remember the Blue Water example, I mean, um, if you live in Orpington uh, and want to go to Blue Water Shopping Centre, you have to drive because, I mean, there, there was one bus, but it's a private bus which will cost you. There's an expert here with the 477's bus fare um, to have 53 pounds, something like that. So you're up there, whereas if you live three or four miles up the road in Sick Cup, you can actually get a bus to Blue Water. It's a TFL bus. There's, you know, they, 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 you know, there's a big divide between you know, the areas of, say, Kent and Surrey, just outside London, and, and the areas of London which actually consider themselves Kent and Surrey. I, 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 I'm sure that's true. <laughs> you know, if, if you want to go to Blue Water, and, uh, that's quite a big if. There are lots of people in the There are no alternative but yeah. to go by a car. Okay. All right, guys, lots of hands up. So, was this a point on this? Um, regarding um, travel sort of around the peripheral areas of London, um, I'm sure a lot of you are probably quite familiar with the fuss about. Westminster extending their parking mm. charges and the um, restrictions on single yellow lines to Sundays and um, weekday evenings. Um, because I'm from outside London, um, this doesn't affect me particularly, but most of the time. But if I travel to London, I have to bear in mind that I won't be able to get a train back after a certain time. How do you consider the role? It, so in that case, I don't actually think that the parking charges are reasonable because they will hinder people getting back to places that aren't necessarily served by night buses. Um, so what do you think of like sort of late night uh, public transport services? Because they do, London is supposed to be a 24-hour city, but the tube is um, shut down at a certain time. So how do we get back to Adelaide? Oh, you can't do a 24-hour bus service. <laughs> <laughs> or make the train companies run trains further into the night. You know, or, you, you, even if it is just you know, Wednesday, thir you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday evenings, that they're running the trains further in the evening, it would certainly alleviate the problems with Westminster introducing those charges and actually make Westminster a much nicer place to be as well. Yeah, I think it's a difficult balance. I mean, for most local authorities, they don't necessarily make much money out of their, their parking charges. Westminster is an exception where they make um, huge amounts. Yeah. Um, but it, it is a difficult issue. And I, and I guess, I mean, all local authorities are under pressure in terms of their finances, so they're looking for all opportunities to, to raise income. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm like the gentleman at the back, I'm from Bromley. And, um, He's left to get the last train. <laughs> well, it's... Uh, um, stuck here. I'm here by bike tonight, so... Um, it's, it's absolutely fascinating what's happening in Bromley at the moment, because obviously it's a, a conservative-led council. Um, but there's, you know, they're going through the sort of funding application process right now. And a lot of the, you know, like Bromley North, where I'm from, Beckenham, they are seriously considering, I can't believe it, they are seriously considering heavily pedestrianised, you know, urban centres. Where, for, Bro for Bromley Town Centre? Well, it's, I'm not, I've not heard of the Bromley North one, but that's news to me, but Beckenham, they are actually yeah. considering it. And, uh, uh, it's fascinating because I'm, I'm not, I just can't believe it's going to happen. Um, because I think the, when you actually speak to the constituency, you know, the core constituency, there's a, you know, I'm going to generalise, but if you talk about transport, there's two things that come in, and it's a paradox. It's like, well, yeah, uh, oh, congestion is really, really bad. I wish we could do something about it. But we need more parking. 
the, that message is not, you know, it, it has not been delivered to the outer boroughs, and particularly in Bromley, where I live, that's certainly true. And so I think, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've seen this over and over again. I don't know whether what's happening in Bromley is sort of unique at the moment, and it's not happening everywhere in outer, outer London, but. You know, I'm so kind the of very fascinated. I was getting was that they, they were trying to increase the amount of parking there. Yeah, yeah, well, I know. But they and, and, and try and get more cars in there. Because well, that's no, not true in Beckenham. That's well, certainly not true in Beckenham. So, but, you know, that, that message of, you know, the paradox of greater parking, but, you know, let's reduce the congestion. That message has not got through to the constituency. And I think, you know, it'll be interesting to see how the, the politicians try and get round that or not get round it and just say, Let's just, you know, pop. let's just build a multi-storey car park to solve the problem. Well, uh, Bromley is perhaps not typical of out of London boroughs. I mean, it's only got two um, <coughs> two town centres. I think Bromley is the big one of them, and the other is Beckenham. Um, is it or Peter? Yeah, yeah, is that yeah. uh, right? Yeah. Um, and and what, what, we, what the two examples we've been talking about? Well, I'm in the north of, of the boroughs. So very very north of the borough. And uh, I think Bromley's staging north of the borough. Well. And a very large part of Bromley is Greenbelt, isn't it? Exactly. It isn't the developed. Trees, yeah. um, and, and, and there's parts of it that are developed. Quite a lot of it is sort of very, very sparsely developed, um, sort of uh, <coughs> uh, wealthy areas, I imagine. So it's very car and, and, and I think, um, you know, more, it, it probably has more than the outer London average of journeys made by cars. Um, it's, like yeah. it's, it's in the top five. Yeah. And, and it's also, well, but it doesn't, it's, it, that doesn't distinguish it from other London cars. It's, 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 it's quite conservative as well. So. But I mean, it is very interesting, as you say, if there are proposals now to, um, to pedestrianise largely. Um, well, you know, you, but, you know when, when the, so the politicians are thinking one thing, let's go and apply for the money. Yeah. But when you actually, you know, when you look on the forums and actually talk to people, they don't really get it. No. Well, the businesses know. seem to be actually for it, but the constituency, you know, the voters, where they, you know, well, basically the Tories are going to get their votes from, don't get it. Right? Yeah, no. Yeah. But it's, a, I mean, it's interesting that that is actually politicians which is part of the role of politicians, is, is, is leading people through difficult decisions rather than just yes. sort of blindly bowing to them. As Livingston did with congestion. Yeah, yeah, constituency, then it's a really interesting thing. I guess if you can do it in Bromley, by the sounds of it, you can do it anywhere. Mark, I'll come back to you in a second. We're just going to take these two <coughs> over, over here. Uh, start at the front and then... Okay, thanks. I was just picking up on the uh, gentleman here about the election issue. Um, I think there's a lot and out of London, because certainly there was a, a really big election issue in 2008 in out of London, in, in uh, Bexley and Greenwich and Newark, which was the Thames Gateway Road Bridge. But um, I worked on, I'm sorry, I didn't say before, I'm from Friends of the Earth, I'm the London campaigner, and I worked very closely with Richard Bourne of CBT to fight that, and it was a Ken Livingston plan, and actually a lot of people who were, who were you know, actually long life, long time Labour supporters, you know, just couldn't face, you know, this <coughs> scheme going ahead with all the extra traffic that we've created. And, and that was a, a serious election issue. I think it was the one sort of um, GLA area that, you know, had the lowest sort of rate for Ken and the biggest sort of increase for, for Boris or whatever. So it was an election issue. Um, and sadly now Boris is, is you know, showing his true colours and he's now promoting um, you know, even another crossing there, but first going for one at the, a third Blackwall. Um, so, you know, that's something that people could to, could try and do. Whether we could ever get Ken to change his mind is something I'm, I'm trying to think about and work on. But, um, you know, that certainly would have been, you know, the name of your organisation, Livable London, it would have been totally, you know, less walking, cycling, less use of public transport, more accidents, more traffic, likely more congestion. Um, worse for air pollution, taking it over an EU limit, which wouldn't have been without, you know, it, it would have been unbelievable. So, uh, let's see. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Um, on a scale of 1 to 10, you know, 1 is impossible and 10 is very likely that will happen. Now, how likely do you think it is I can persuade my outer London uh, council to persuade them, can I persuade them 
So I'm going to take one parking space out of my street and in this place put a Copenhagen style cycle storage facility. So you can get five bikes in this, this one floor. Like that, all over Copenhagen, most of the time. How likely is that one to ten will get that number? Do you live in Bromley? Smart club stuff and seventy five percent of And when will I be? I've got the same problem with Camden, I don't, I don't think it would be easy there. But, uh, I mean, that's the only thing we need. We're going to get people in their bikes. As John said on his article a year or two ago, we need the bike sheds out of the start. And we don't need the New developments today, the answer to that question I can tell you is because there's new developments open today, on the market today, where if there is cycling in the park, it has to be provided to the ground back of the tracks for the feet away. And yet, it could quite easily be put out in front of the street. So I've asked that question. I think it's unlikely, but I think that that could change. I think that the parking issue is one that is the most difficult to, to win because yeah. people have cars and they want to park them. Um, I think that will only change when, when a significant, well, we, in inner London you've got a large percentage of the population who don't have cars as well, where there is more possibility. But I think the car ownership side of things is the difficult one. And I think in some ways, um, sort of, a lot of transport professionals have been focused on, on, on car use and not worrying about car ownership, as everyone is, is, with the high rates of car ownership, it's more difficult to, to get some of the successes that you want, and there is a default that you have a car, you, you will use it because you spend that much money sitting outside depreciating, you want to use it. And I think um, there's perhaps more of an onus on people like us to start thinking about different models of ownership, and there is an interest in, in many London boroughs about car clubs as a one way to, to do that. You talk to officers from, from across London boroughs, that's kind of one of the things they talk about. Um, in the, the Victorian suburban area I live in, um, there's a consultation on, on a, on a um, controlled parking zone because lots of people from further out in London come and park in our streets to get into zone two and to take the train, it's cheaper. Um, and one of the things there is actually about encouraging car clubs. And I think it's the great thing that hasn't really happened and taken off. But I think lots of the changes that are taking place in terms of how people view sort of um, ownership of lots of things across the world, like like kind of um, the change in attitude towards, towards music, say, where you actually act, pay to access music, not necessarily to go and own CDs. And amongst young people, I think that will change in terms of attitudes towards owning cars. Car manufacturers are really worried about young people because they're not interested in cars as objects of desires, they're interested in, in, in smartphones and those kinds of things. And I think you might soon start to see a change in, in attitudes towards car ownership, and that's where we can start to win arguments about parking and start to win arguments about, about putting more space, both for, for, for uh, social spaces like building streets we call for, uh, or in terms of, kind of things like, like car club spaces and also in terms of, of cycle storage as well. Yeah, it seems to me I'd, I'd, I'd probably put your chances towards them. Was it was it was it <coughs> what, was the impossible <laughs> at the moment? But, I mean, it it seems to me it ought, it, it ought to be the case that. Um, that if, if four people on your street can go to the council and say we all have colour in bikes and we need someone to store them, uh, and one of those people at least is prepared to say I'll, I will give up my car to allow that, uh, then you know that that ought to be the way you have the argument. We get, I mean, the difficulty is that when the council say, well, that's great, but you know how do we know you're actually going to give up your right to tell you control parking zone? Yeah. These spaces are used the most today. The mm -hmm. nice and the intense are very it's finding ways to kind of mediate those conversations a bit as well. So, uh, so Living Streets had some projects, I think it was in um, in Southwark, where he was looking about what changes they could do by consulting people about different areas of the street, and, and that's kind of the, the finding ways to, to do that consultation and mediate between different interests is one way to do it. And the DIY Streets project in Sustrand is also similar, where actually if you can engage people in the discussion, so you're not simply consulting on proposals, you're engaging them from the start in, 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 in alternatives, that's where you might start to see a difference. And where people can see some of the benefits in terms of reallocating space to different functions, and then you can, you can start to win the case more as well. Just on car clubs, when they do consult me on a car club, make sure they actually take a parking space out and replace it with a car club one, rather than create a new car club parking space, which is what happened on our street. Um, Mark? Um, I had Two quick points. One was um, I went to go and see uh, a new film which is coming up generally soon called Urbanised, which is all about the issues that we will get together and talk about 
and the uh, the moral of the story uh, by the director was get involved in local decisions about how your locality is shaped, otherwise other people will make those decisions for you. Um, I think everyone here probably does that already, but it's worth seeing. Um, the second question I had was, um, we were talking about local borough councils, uh, sometimes you know, having the balls to do really good ideas, like in Bromley, and I wonder um, to what extent, uh, the, the main reason most people driving out to London is because of the connectivity. It's really easy to get from A to B over a large distance because of the, the major road network, the, the, the red routes, the TLRN. Um, that's kind of like a, a big inviting carpet. You know, the conditions are inviting for driving. Um, anything that we do to try and change the TLRN is always turned down by Transport for London on account of the fact that it will affect the smoothing the traffic flow agenda. Transport for London aren't elected or especially accountable. So how do we, how do we kind of, what, what's been your experience of trying to affect those main routes? Because that's where I think the potential is um, against the sort of, you know, the beam off of TFL. Well, TFL is subject to democratic control in, in one important way, which is that it has to do the bidding of the mayor who is elected. <laughs> and, um, and, and actually does so to a remarkable degree, to a depressing degree, um, because the TFL was itself the source of the most critical report about the amount of car parking in, um, in Red Cross that was submitted to the, um, to the planning office in the, in the, in the GLA, who advised the mayor. Um, and, and suddenly at some point um, in the process, TFL withdrew its criticism, to that saying so, um, and, 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 and said that it was now satisfied with the proposals that had been submitted. And, uh, you know, it was clearly um, a, a, a case of the, the TFL having been told to shut up by its political master and doing so. And um, I think, um, you know, it, it does the mayor's bidding. In, uh, I mean, it's now um, enthusiastically promoting smoothing traffic flow, which um, others would say is, um, is that about to increasing the capacity of the road network for uh, larger volumes of traffic. Okay, so that ties in then to this idea that we discussed earlier that drivers are perceived, certainly in outer London where the majority of people are, drivers are perceived as voters. Um, we've seen from the statistics that that's certainly not actually true. Of course, not all drivers are desperate for motorways to be built in their back gardens. Yeah. So it comes down to a much larger point of how do we reframe the entire debate, which is kind of the whole point of why we get together and, and talk about these things. What would be your advice for making it kind of slightly less rabid anti-car sounding and more kind of... I, I think one of the things is about people wanting what they want for their own streets is very different to what they want. If they want their streets that they live in to be safe for people to, to walk and cycle, they want to have lower volumes of traffic, they want to have lower speeds. And that doesn't translate into then when they leave their, their own streets, and obviously that's a, it's inconsistent to, to, to that, that view. So, so one of the things is about starting about the, the, the local streets that you live on. What do you want from your local streets? And why don't you want that elsewhere? And you're realising you have to kind of give up some of that if you want to go somewhere else. Um, I think that's one of the ways through to it. And so it is the argument about the kind of places that you want to go to are the places where there, there isn't lots of traffic and where speeds are lower. That's the kind of places that people, people want. And in order to create those kind of places, you have to say that actually you need to reduce traffic. And the way to reduce traffic is the kind of measures that we were talking about as well. And I think people accept that often as well. Um, so there, there is a desire to improve public transport. But it's also of, of, often about, well, public transport is just so poor because it doesn't do the basics right. So part of it is also about trying to make sure that we do the basics right in public transport, which is a lot of our focus for our campaign. It's about having more joint up team ticketing, more simple yeah. ticketing, and about improving information, and about having decent service levels. And that's the kind of way to start to win the argument. So it's about 